Cyrus Field had no trouble finding backers for his transatlantic cable venture. It's amazing the number of wealthy friends that Field had who were eager to help him in the project. There was the great iron magnate and philanthropist uh, Peter Cooper. There was Moses Taylor of banking fame and Marshall Roberts of the Erie Railroad. Several of the industrial giants of America helped to form a company which became known as the New York, Newfoundland and London Telegraph Company. The company's first project was to finish the telegraph cable across the 400 mile width of Newfoundland, the easternmost part of North America. When completed in 1856, the company's telegraph network spanned nearly 1,000 miles from New York to St. John's, Newfoundland. Total cost for the project was well over a million dollars. Now one has to remember that a million dollars in those days, the relative value of the dollar means about 50 million dollars in today's dollars. The average Eastern working man put in 12 hours a day for a single dollar. So a million dollars was a serious outlay of capital. Unfortunately, completing the cable to Newfoundland was a lot bigger job than anyone anticipated and they ended up using all of their resources just on that leg of the project. It was time to regroup and seek new investors and work on figuring out where they were going to get a ship to do it and where they were going to get a cable long enough to lay across the ocean floor. Though Field had many people convinced that his project was feasible, there were some who thought it was preposterous. Corporate giant Western Union spoke out strongly against Field's venture. They had their own grand plan to reach Europe by way of telegraph. Their route required only 56 miles of submarine cable across the Bering Strait via Alaska. Western Union had one outfit in Alaska and another outfit in Siberia. Their job was to gather poles for the telegraph wires and to negotiate with the natives for a right-of-way along the proposed route of the telegraph. And while they found plenty of timber in Alaska, they found almost no trees in Siberia. And this meant they had some almost insurmountable obstacles to overcome. But Western Union's view was that any route would be more feasible than something as risky as stretching a cable across 3,000 miles of water. Field ignored Western Union's logic. He was convinced the transatlantic route was possible and proceeded to lock down landing rights on both continents for his future wire. It was important to take the shortest route possible across the Atlantic uh, because it's a long ways. Uh, they settled on a direct route from westernmost part of Ireland across to Newfoundland, which is the closest part of the North American continent to, to Europe. Now, with a mere 2,500-mile route established, Field was more confident than ever. He and his associates were able to get the British government to supply two ships, a small convoy, and money for the operation. This was an exchange for the transmission of government messages on the new cable, should it ever work. Unfortunately, in Field's homeland, America, it wasn't so easy. Western Union had begun work on its telegraph line through Alaska. Not many investors in the U.S. would doubt the expertise of such an immensely powerful and profitable corporation that strongly opposed the transatlantic cable. Field pleaded with the U.S. government for support in the form of naval ships. He needed them to make up half the convoy to get the wire across the ocean. The needed resolutions in Congress barely passed, and President Franklin Pierce signed them into law on his last day in office, March 3, 1857. Field's next priority was to begin manufacturing the submarine wire. Since cable laying in the North Atlantic was restricted to summer months due to weather conditions, he needed the cable immediately. Field, in his usual impatient manner, only gave Glass Elliott and Company, the entity that was manufacturing the cable, only four months to produce the cable. 
as a result, the cable probably wasn't as good as it could have been. You can't just dump this wire in, in the water because it shorts out. So what you do then is you coat it with some material called gutta percha. Gutta percha has virtually no strength and the copper doesn't have very much. So you put iron wires around the outside. You look inside and there's our copper wire in the middle, gutta percha around it. Now we've got this protective wire on the outside. In order to carry and pay out 2,500 tons of this cable, the two ships provided by the American and British governments had been extensively modified with circular tanks to store the massive wire. They loaded the cable onto two ships. It took 120 men three weeks to load the 2,000 some odd miles of cable onto the two boats. The plan was to start off in Ireland with one of the ships laying the cable. At mid-ocean, they would splice the cable to the second ship, and the second ship would carry on to New Finland. On the morning of August 5, 1857, with Cyrus Field on board, the cable was connected to the Irish shore with a huge celebratory send-off. To ensure that the cable remained intact, signals were continuously broadcast over the line from ship to shore. But only five miles were laid down when the cable got caught up in the ship's machinery and broke. This was quickly repaired and the mission continued. But then, 10 days and 300 miles into the mission, a real disaster struck. An anxious engineer, fearing that the cable was paying out too fast, suddenly applied the brakes. The brakes locked and the cable snapped. And the severed end of the cable, representing a half million dollars worth of cable labor and time, 25 million in today's dollars, plunged into the sea and disappeared. A portion of Field's original cable was recently pulled from the ocean. Though over 100 years old, it could still conduct electricity. 